the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run. 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. Hello, this is Anne Foster, and you are listening to Vulgar History. And this is really exciting. Um, this is the fourth episode, and this is the first one that I've recorded since the podcast has been out there in the world. Not on iTunes yet, but, you know, fingers crossed. It's in, it's in other places. People have been listening and waving at you. The listeners, the, the people who are there on day one. I also, thanks to the generosity of my gorgeous patrons on Patreon, I bought a thing, a pop filter from a microphone. So. Hopefully the, the sound will be a bit more professional sounding. There won't be, my S's won't be so snaky or my P's won't pop quite as much. Or I'm not sure what this does, but it's super cute. I'll put a picture of it on Instagram. It's got a little dog face on it. Anyway, also from having recorded and edited the first three episodes, I realized how much I smack my lips. So I'm going to try and be mindful and not do that quite so much because this is not an ASMR podcast. This is Vulgar History, the feminist women's history comedy podcast hosted by me, Anne Foster. And this week we're getting into the first, so we've done some British women, we've done a French woman, and today we're doing a Hungarian woman. Renaissance Hungary is not a time or place that I knew lots about to begin with, which is why it's been a while for me to to read up on this and figure out what is going on, just to sort of understand the time and the place. Because this this podcast and this episode of this podcast is really about looking at this woman, what her life was like, not so much getting into the minutia of the wars that were being fought around her because she wasn't fighting in the wars, but they had a profound effect on her life. 
The woman we are looking at today is a woman who we all, if you've heard of her, you've heard of her under her anglicized name, which is Elizabeth Bathory. Her name in Hungarian was Erzbet Bathory, but as she's famous as Elizabeth Bathory, and since I'm talking in English, I'm going to refer to her as Elizabeth Bathory, because part of what this episode is doing, and I also just posted an, an essay about her on my website and fosterwriter.com as well, is just to try and do my little part to expand the conversation about this woman. Because when you look up information about Elizabeth Bathory, especially in the English version of the name, you just get a lot of information about the myth, the mythology of her as the, the prolific female serial killer, etc. And what I want to do in this episode is to sort of break down where that myth came from, who she actually was, what actually happened with her in her life. And that is what we're going to do today at the end of the episode. Like at the end of every other episode, we're going to break down her story onto our scale to see where she scores. Not that the women whose stories we're sharing on this podcast are in competition against each other, but just so we can have a scale to sort of gauge where she fits in um, in the general scandalousness sorts of categories. So in researching this, I was reading a bunch and I listened to a bunch of other podcasts about Elizabeth Bathory and more so than other things I've researched. And just because I think there's so much more in existence about Elizabeth Bathory, it's trickier to, to look back and find what everybody's sources are that they're using. Because when you're telling her story like a folktale, then you don't really need a source. And side note, I believe the Grimm brothers actually wrote her story as a folktale. So trying to sort of like nudge away the levels of just storytelling and myth and pop culture to look at what the actual history was is part of what made this research more interesting and more challenging than some of the other stories I've looked at. So Elizabeth Bathory, Hungarian name, Elizabeth Bathory, was born in Hungary in 1560. So I'm going to try and explain this in as concise a way as possible so you understand what will be helpful for you to get sort of the context of this entire saga. So, and I've been reading about the history of Hungary and it's super interesting and I recommend reading about it because it's, it's all really interesting. But today we're talking about Elizabeth Bathory. So we're just going to look at what was up in Hungary during the time that she was alive, which is basically, so she was born in 1560. Hungary at the time was divided into three parts, and this has happened over the course of numerous wars and things. So the northwest part was kind of royal Hungary, the kingdom of Hungary, and it was ruled over by the royal family who were the Habsburgs, who are a family of, they're always involved when you're looking at the history of like Hungary, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, um, they went over, they were they intermarried with the Spanish royals. Well, like there's just Habsburgs are all over the place. Were we to make some sort of bingo card for this podcast, I think they would be the center square because basically every story that I'm going to look at, I just keep, not on purpose, I just keep finding Habsburgs connections. So basically they were this super powerful rich royal family, and they were ruling the the one part of Hungary, the northwest part, uh, royal Hungary. The And this is where Elizabeth Bathory was from, that part. So her family, the Bathories, were a noble Hungarian family. The middle part of Hungary was overseen by the Ottoman Empire. So this was sort of Turkish people were there. And then the eastern bit was Transylvania, a place you might have heard of. And it was sort of adjacent to Royal Hungary. It, they were sort of allies, but they were sort of... Transylvania was its own sort of independent principality. But all these things kept like these borders were permanent or fixed. Like it kept moving back and forth who went where. And the Hungarians versus the Turks was an ongoing series of wars that went on for... Started way before Elizabeth was born kept going way after Elizabeth died. But basically, you've got these three parts. You have sort of royal, the kingdom of Hungary, 
you've got the part over overseen by the Turks, and then you've got to the east, Transylvania. So at the time of her birth, Transylvania was being overseen by Elizabeth's uncle, who was had been elected as the Prince of Transylvania, because it was like a Protestant place where you elected who your king was. Um, and because the Bathories were so rich and powerful, that's who was chosen. When he died, her nephew, Gabor, took over as the new Prince of Transylvania. So just as a side note, the Bathory family itself traces their name, um, which is a Hungarian word, basically, that means good hero, back to a medieval knight named Vitus, who is said to have fought a dragon and saved a village of grateful villagers. And because they were so happy that he'd saved them from the dragon, they gave him the honorary name Bathory as their good hero. And that's why the Bathory family crest is sort of a dragon that's eating its own tail in honor of him. So basically, this is like a hugely respected, super wealthy, super powerful family in Hungary. Everything's great. And Elizabeth Bathory was born in 1560. So just to have everything in context for what else is happening in other history with which you might be familiar. So in 1560... That was two years after Queen Elizabeth I had taken over as queen in England, um, over in France. Charles IX had just taken over as king after the death of his brother Francis, who had been Mary Queen of Scots's first husband. Over in Spain, the king was Philip II, who was the widower of Elizabeth I's sister, Mary I. So basically, the Renaissance was happening and women were in power in a way that they hadn't been historically much before in terms of Europe. So in that sense, for Elizabeth Bathory to be born at this time was pretty lucky for her because it was a time when women, noble women, were expected to become educated in the sense of things they'd been taught before, which was like household management, and sewing and dancing and singing, but also in math and languages. And so she got a super amazing, um, very well-rounded education, uh, including the fact that she became fluent in four different languages. So she was smarter than most other people around her, not just other women, but everybody, basically. So this was another thing that sort of separated people of her class from the lower class people who are the serfs of the times. So this is a sort of situation where the people who are super rich were like so amazingly rich and the people who were poor were like living in the dirt basically. And it was a really strict and structured sort of class system. And one of the ways, one of the things that differentiated the rich from the poor was the fact that people like Elizabeth were well-educated and had this more well-rounded view of the world and how things worked. And also, again, just as more sort of like backgroundy stuff, just bear in mind that recently-ish, um, the serfs had been part of these military campaigns that gone off. They had been soldiers, they had fought on wars on behalf of the noblemen. And then they came back, and so they were all kind of armed and had a lot of strong feelings and sort of were feeling powerful. And so they had revolted a bit, and the upper classes had to sort of beat them back down. I mean, they didn't have to, but that is what happened to retain this social order. What happened is that the rich people felt they needed to brutally torture and murder the peasants. So they did. And that basically quelled that. So everything was back to sort of this sort of uncomfortable status quo while still everybody was at war constantly all the time. But it meant that the wealthy rich people were, in terms of being landowners and in terms of being the bosses of servants, they were all by necessity to maintain their position in society, they were all really um, ruthless and really strict about things. And there was no wiggle room for people to to break rules at all. Because if they did, um, it seemed like chaos and revolution could break out at any moment. Not to say that 
that happening would have been a bad thing, but we're looking at Elizabeth's life, what she was dealing with. So effectively, everybody who she was surrounded by, the all the wealthy people, were constantly doing everything they could to keep the poorer people from revolting against them. So she was trained and she saw the importance of doing this. And I just want to point out for not, I'm sure, the first time or the only time in this podcast that just like everybody in this story is terrible in all different ways. And when everybody is terrible, the only way to survive and to thrive is for you to also be terrible. Like you could run into a situation like this and be like, present moral arguments and explain the common good and stuff. And then you would probably just have your head cut off or something. There wasn't really room or space for that. It was just kind of like a survival of the fittest scenario. And Elizabeth was coming into it with a huge advantage being super rich and wealthy and educated. So she kind of saw what her family was doing. She saw how they acted and she saw how they seemingly needed to act in order to to do well in a world that was like this world they were living in. So she was the only child of her parents. And so it was especially important that she get married to somebody that would be like a good alliance for the Bathory family in terms of alliances with other super rich, powerful families. So when she was about 11 years old, she was betrothed to a man named Lord Ferenc Nadesti, who was 15 years old. So just four years older than her. To me, in general, I just always feel better about an arranged marriage when people are within five years age of each other, even 10 years age of each other. There's just so many situations where someone's 12 and they're betrothed to a man who's 75 or whatever. And I'm just like, just come on. I'm not putting myself in the shoes of of that young girl. I'm happy when it's somebody her own age-ish because I just feel like there's more hope for them to maybe get along as people. So they were betrothed at age 11, which is not weird, totally normal in the situation. And then they didn't get married for another four years. So she was, I think, 15 when they got married, making him about 18. So her husband, Ferenc, his father was the Palatine of Hungary, which is basically a role that I need to explain to you because this is going to become important in the story later on. So the Kingdom of Hungary, this one part of Hungary, was ruled over by these Habsburg kings. But because they were busy and had a lot of stuff to do, they would elect someone called the Palatine, who is sort of like the governor, I guess. It's somebody who would oversee the day-to-day stuff, like go out and meet with the people and try to resolve problems so the king didn't have to bother himself dealing with all of that. So Ferenc's father was that role, which was basically like second most powerful role in Hungary to the king. So basically Elizabeth's husband was coming from a super rich and powerful family. She was from a super rich and powerful family. And when they got together, it just made this huge union of two massive families. So Ferenc himself seems like uh, he was educated at least as much as Elizabeth was, maybe even more. He had both of them because school wasn't a thing, a place you went, but you learn stuff by sort of being sent to another rich person's home and having tutors and sort of like apprentice mentoring, watching other people doing the stuff that you needed to know. So both Ferenc and Elizabeth had learned a lot through this way. When they grew up, they took in young people to do the same thing with them. But Ferenc, um, when he was 17 years old, he was, uh, this wasn't like a beauty pageant or whatever, but somebody wrote in the letter that he was the most promising young nobleman at the court. So great things are expected of him. So it's not just that Elizabeth and Frank were of similar ages and the same class, but they were also, they would have a lot to talk about because they were both similarly well-educated. They could talk about all the books they read, etc. So way later on, after a whole bunch of stuff has happened that I haven't told you about, there were rumors that during this betrothal period, when Elizabeth was somewhere between aged 11 and 15, she secretly had an affair with somebody and secretly had a love child um, and that her family covered that all up. And that's just like, not likely, but it sort of became part of the romantic myth of her later on. Anything is possible, but also this just seems like probably not something 
said would have happened. And there's no records of it happening contemporaneously, only later on people writing weird made-up biographies of her. So when Elizabeth and Ferenc were married on May 8th, 1575, oh, sorry, she was 15 and he was 20 years old. So it was a massive affair. Um, there was something like 4,500 invited guests, not including the peasants from the nearby countryside who like were invited and they could come and watch the festivities and hang out and like come to the market and stuff. So it was just like, seemingly, they were so rich and important that everybody wanted to be there and everybody was. And so they got married, huge event. And then they went off to, to go and be newlyweds together. And one of the main the reasons why two two families would marry off like this is so that they could have a child and that child would sort of like be a living embodiment of those two families being united. Elizabeth and Ferenc did not have any children for the first 10 years of their marriage for, I'm sure, lots of reasons why that didn't happen. But basically the way that medical knowledge worked at this time and place was... Um, it was believed that it was always the women's something wrong with a woman if if a young, seemingly healthy couple was having trouble conceiving. So they would have thought it was something wrong with her and perhaps something wrong with her spiritually. Uh, the sort of the overlap of like what is medicine with what is superstition with like what is herbs and what is witchcraft were all sort of overlapping. So who knows what what different remedies she might have tried, but eventually, 10 years after they were married in 1585, she gave birth to their first child, a daughter who they named Anna. Then they had another daughter named Ursula and a son named Andrew, but Ursula and Andrew both died in infancy. Then Elizabeth had another daughter named Catalin and then a son named Paul. So surviving children, two daughters, one son, Anna, Catalin, and Paul. So because Ferenc was often away on military campaigns against the Turkish, because this was a situation where the Hungarians and the Turkish people were at war constantly all the time, and Ferenc was a military leader, this was also a situation where the people who were the most rich and powerful men personally went and fought on the front lines of battles, which even 100 years later, was not as common. But so Ferenc would, would go off and do that. And so while he was away, and there are archival letters and documents showing this, Elizabeth would run the household, and she was really good at doing that. It shows that she was, like, what letters and stuff still exist, so that she was really organized, super on top of things. She was an extremely good CEO of running their enormous household and estates. She was also really good at writing. She didn't use flowery language at all. Her letters are all written really well. She, you know, good use of language and grammar and stuff and just nothing florid, no poetic touches. She was very straight, straightforward to the point sort of person. Around this time, so the governess for the children, seemingly this woman was the governess of the children. She might have had a different important servant job. But anyway, a woman named Anna Dervulia is known to have joined their household at around this time. There's also a young man known as Fixco, who became one of their servants. And both of these people become important later. So Anna Dervulia. In some of the myths of Elizabeth Bathory, in some of the movies and sexy books written about her, Anna Dervulia is presented as like her sort of evil lover, but there's nothing in what few records remain suggesting that that was the situation. I'm not, like, that could have been the situation. But what we do know about Anna Dervulia is that her last name, so Dervulia was probably a nickname, but the word has neither Hungarian nor Slovak roots, so we're not sure where she came from exactly. But in 1602, so that's like, 15, 17 years after the first children were born, and Anna de Verlia was maybe their governess, a minister from near where they lived recorded a complaint that Anna 
Dervulia had been acting cruelly to the young servant women. So this suggests that Anna might have been sort of like the head housekeeper, the person who supervised the young women servants. Unclear. But basically in this complaint, um, Elizabeth and Ferenc were both also sort of condemned by this minister who said, like, basically these people are up to no good, don't like what they're doing. And so just keep that in the back of your mind for later. And then shortly after that happened, um, while he was away, Ferenc was, he came down with some sort of mysterious disease and it made him suddenly unable to use his legs. And then by 1604, he was basically dying and he knew he was dying. And in he did a thing that very rich people did in Hungary at this time, which was basically he wrote a letter to the new Palatine of Hungary. So remember, his father used to be Palatine of Hungary, but now someone new was in that job of like governor of Hungary. And Frank wrote a letter saying like, you know, once I die, I requested you, the Palatine of Hungary, please look after my wife and my children and my estates. And uh, because women couldn't own property, so everything was supposed to get sort of complicated. Anyway, the new Palatine of Hungary was a man named Georgi Thurzo, and he would become the man responsible for Elizabeth Bathory's entire downfall. So the fact that a fairy wrote him a letter being like, look out for my family is just sort of like huge foreshadowing of everything. So the thing is that Elizabeth was super powerful. Her family's super powerful. Her nephew was the Prince of Transylvania. She owned, I forget, some huge proportion of just like all the property in Hungary. Like the between when her family joined with Ferenc's family, they just took over everything. But now that she was a widow, her house and her estates and stuff would, I guess, go to her young son, Paul, who wasn't even 10 years old yet. He was a little kid. So sort of created a power vacuum where if she was a man, this wouldn't be a problem. Or if they're laws were different, this wouldn't be a problem, but basically she was 44 years old and had been basically single-handedly running all these estates for this whole time because Frank was away so often. So she was capable of doing this, but just legally she couldn't be in charge of anything. And so a bunch of men were like, aha, this is our chance to take over and get some more money because just a reminder, everybody in the story is the worst. So Thurzo, the Palatine of Hungary, was like, seemed to be interested in taking over some of her land. Um, her son Paul's guardian slash tutor, who's a man named Imri Megyeri, also seems to have wanted to maybe get a bit more control than Harry had. And her two daughters had both married, and their husbands also seemed to have been like keen to, to get some of her money in the States. Her daughters probably did too, because basically everybody wanted her money. So it's the sort of thing where like when you become the most rich and powerful person, like you have the money and you have the power, but that also puts you the most at risk because now everybody wants to steal it from you. Everybody was sort of scheming around to see what they could do. And Thurzo had an extra reason for wanting to, to get rid of her which was basically that he, as the representative of the king, wanted to take over Transylvania because Transylvania was this like independent principality currently being ruled over by Elizabeth's nephew, Gabor, who was like 17 years old and pretty awful from everything I read about him. He was sort of like Nero meets Caligula meets Joffrey from Game of Thrones, like just sort of a grosso. But the reason that Thurzo wanted to get rid of him was because Thurzo, I think, uh, wanted to make Transylvania part of the Kingdom of Hungary again and perhaps wanted to make himself, Thurzo, the new prince of it. He was sort of fearing that if Gabor, the prince of Transylvania, teamed up with Elizabeth Bathory with all of their power and wealth and stuff, that just wouldn't be good for Thurzo. It might get him out of power and so he tried to figure out what to do. And his first plan was to just have Gabor assassinated, but that plan was foiled at the last minute. And so then he moved on to plan B, which was basically to destroy the Bathory family reputation, which is what he started to do next. 
So a couple of just things to point out. First of all, is that in 17th century royal Hungary, if you weren't a noble person, you basically didn't have any rights at all. Like if people killed someone's servant, that was seen as not as bad a crime as killing someone's cow. Like killing serfs was sort of not a crime, which is something that happened in a lot of cultures and a lot of societies all over the place. But I'm bringing it up because what is going to happen, spoiler for fairly well-known history, is that Elizabeth is going to be accused of mass murder, serial killing, hundreds of peasant girls. And so I just want to point out at this point that basically, even if she did do that, which she might have done that, that wasn't a crime at the time. So Thurzo basically, I think, was trying to figure out things to do to get rid of Elizabeth to, to make her have less power. And he would have come across this thing that the minister wrote saying that the fa- that, that household was treating their servants especially cruelly. And there was sort of war on the street that maybe the, that house was, um, that some of the female servants were being mistreated there. And I mean, side note, servant women were being mistreated everywhere, but potentially it was they're being mistreated more than the usual amount in this house. But again, that's not against the law. So Thurzo is not the sort of person to be like morally outraged by that. Um, He's not someone who's like, we need to change the laws so we can protect the serfs from being mistreated by their mistresses. He was just like, oh, this is a way I could get rid of Elizabeth Bathory. Amazing. Let's just see where this takes us. So I just want to clarify that like, she might have killed a bunch of people. Thurzo went after her for allegedly having done that, but that wasn't because he thought that was a bad thing for her to have done. He was doing it because he thought it was a way that he could take over her house, basically. So he was sort of running around like casually, um, informally chatting with people in the nearby village, being like, so tell me about how Elizabeth Bathory is maybe like totally awful and mistreats her servants and the young women who are sent there to learn from her. And he started collecting sort of statements from people. The statements were mostly coerced and they were mostly from people who were related to him or indebted to him in some way or were people who were tortured. So they're not everything they said could be true, but his methods put that into question. Elizabeth clearly seemed to suspect what he was up to because at one point before she was even arrested, she went to a local authority with the mother of one of her servants who died while living with her to explain that the girl had been ill and had just died of natural causes. So that's super interesting in and of itself because again, like even if she had killed the servant that wasn't a crime so to like take the girl's mother into the authorities to be like hey guess what elizabeth bathory didn't kill my daughter it's just interesting because even if she had the authorities would be like who cares so it seems like she kind of knew that these charges were maybe coming against her and she thought of well here's this one person who died so i'm going to make sure that they don't accuse me of killing this one person and so the thing is that a lot of people were dying in and around this place at this time for lots of reasons, including the plague, dying in childbirth, uh, lack of medical intervention, penicillin hadn't been invented, lots of things. So for someone running a huge estate like she had, every year probably some servants would die regardless, but Thurzo is trying to make it seem like there was something weird and suspicious about how many people were dying. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and, for shoppers, buying simple. 
For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not so secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today shopify.com slash realm. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the search for the silver lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. I'm Brennan Store. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live, or at ghoststoryguys.com. And we're back. So, that being said, it does seem like some of the young women who were working in her house were treated really badly, which again, they probably were in other places too. But the fact that some people found it like a bit much or a bit weird would ultimately fall on Elizabeth because she was the owner um, and all the servants worked for her. But it seems like it might have been her sort of higher up servants, people like Anna Darvulia who maybe were really rough on the other servants. So did Elizabeth know how much they were doing? We don't know. Um, Did Elizabeth instruct them to use these methods? We don't know. But again, it was sort of a brutal time and place where, where servants would have been treated really poorly. Anyway, so I'm just kind of trying to show all the sides here. It, it does seem like maybe something weird happened at least once in her house with regards to a young woman dying. Were 650 people murdered? We'll get to that, but I'm thinking no. So, but again, if servants are being killed, if people are being mistreated, like the minister wrote up a note and everyone was kind of like, big, who cares? But Thurzo was like, hmm, maybe there's something here. But still at the same time, like that, that wasn't something he could charge them with. So what he had to do was find a way to suggest that she had been responsible for killing someone who wasn't a servant, someone who was seen as a person. So he had to start suggesting that she had been responsible for the murder of wealthy young women, like some of the young women who would be sent to her house for um, schooling type purposes. So the other thing about all of this is because she was so rich, and so just the way that sort of the law worked as well, which said that like serfs are not people, 
rich people are people, but it basically said that rich people are such people. Like you can't charge a noble woman with anything. You can never put a rich person on trial. That was basically, as I understand it, <laughs> from having been researching this for like two weeks. It seems like that was the law. So Thurzo knew that even if he found something he could charge her with, he would never be able to put Elizabeth on trial because she was so rich. Basically, she could counter sue him for charging her with a crime. But the loophole he figured out was that if he was able to catch her in the act of doing a crime, she could be arrested without even needing to be put on trial. So this is where we get sort of two two parallel narratives, which is sort of what the legend is. The legend and the myth is that he walked in on her in the act of murdering a young woman. What the records seem to suggest is that he said he did that. <laughs> he uh, So on December 30th, as Elizabeth and her, her household were sitting down for sort of a nice Christmas season meal, um, he came in and arrested her along with four of her servants. And he said that he had seen her killing someone. So the story of him walking in on her killing someone seems to not be true because if that was the case, why would he then leave, come back later and arrest her? And why would she just be like casually having dinner if she knew that she'd just been caught murdering someone? Doesn't quite add up. So basically he came in, he said, I'm here to arrest her because I saw her killing somebody. And they were like, well, where's your evidence of that? And he's like, hang on. Um, and then 24 hours later, he provided the dead body of a dead girl that had been dug up from outside the castle. So this could be a girl who died of lots of different things. Um, she could have died of plague. She could have died, which plague was happening all over the place. She could have died of many different things. She might have been murdered by Elizabeth Bathory. The body was like sort of tied up, which some people thought was like a, a hint of Elizabeth Bathory doing sort of weird sex things or whatever. But that's basically what you did to bodies to bury them. So that's not actually weird. And he also brought in a young woman who was not dead, but who was pretty grievously injured. So again, he might have found someone who is injured to bring her in as evidence. He might have perhaps injured her himself to bring her in. Or maybe he is telling the truth and these were Elizabeth Bathory's victims. But basically, he came in and arrested her. And so the four servants that were arrested as well were named Helena Jo, Dorothy Sentes, who is known as Dorco, a woman named Catalin Benica, and a young man named Fizco. Anna Darvulia, not there anymore. To me, she's like the most interesting part of this whole story. Like people kept being like, it was nice. It was Anna Darvulia, where it's like, that's who I think the legend should be all about. She's the one who like should be called Dracula. Where did she go? Where did she come from? Like what's, anyway, she's long gone by this point, whatever. Elizabeth and four of her servants were arrested. And the thing is that he couldn't put her on trial because again, she was super rich. So he just put her in jail and put the four servants on trial. So just sort of another side note, I guess, which is that this isn't like Georgi Thurzo coming up with this genius idea all on his own for the first time ever. He himself had done this. He'd railroaded other nobles like this and then took over their castles. This was a thing he had done. Um, he knew that it was an effective technique. Um, the Habsburg royal family who he worked for had also done this sort of thing. Um, they all knew that doing sort of a show trial where you make somebody seem like they're doing something terrible and then public perception is colored is a way to dispatch of your enemies. So it's not like legend of Elizabeth's serial killing spread far and wide and they had to do this thing that was weird. It's like, no, this was a thing they did all the time to lots of people. This is just an instance of it where it got really extreme. So basically, again, Elizabeth might have been totally or partially responsible for the deaths of some young women who'd been in her care but even if she had been, that wasn't a crime in this time and place. It would be a terrible thing. It would make her sort of a shitty person. But that's not why Thurzo had arrested her, really. He just wanted to ruin her reputation. And saying that she had killed some servants wasn't enough to ruin her reputation because everyone would be like, big shrug, like, whatever. We all kill servants. We're like, 
the noble rich people of Renaissance Hungary. So he had to make it seem like weird and also extreme, which is why he started getting testimony and witness statements from people who started saying stuff that like she was into like weird sex stuff um, that she hadn't just killed one or two people, but like hundreds of people like they just made took it to this whole extreme level to explain why it was so bad that she had to be locked up and have her land taken away and the land given to him. So this is where uh, the interviews slash interrogations began. So the four servants themselves are questioned and all of them kind of all blamed each other and or Anna Dervulia. But also it's sort of hard to, in the, the book I was reading about it, was explaining how the way that pronouns worked in Hungary at the time and potentially Hungary at this time, I'm not familiar with contemporary Hungarian ling linguistics, but basically um, pronouns, the same word was used for he and for she. So even within that, it's hard to tell when the, and the, the notes taken from these servants' statements aren't complete because it's somebody writing down what somebody said. So when they say like, she did it, she killed him, like that could be saying he killed her, he, she killed him, like you don't know who they mean, but basically they all, the consensus seemed to be that the one servant named Dorko was perhaps the most responsible so she might have been the one who took over as being in charge of the servants after Anna Dervulia left, unclear. But basically, out of all the servants, the woman named Catalin, everyone sort of agreed that she was like the least responsible. Like she had been asked to, to torture these girls in some way that she was uncomfortable with and she refused to do it. So then she herself got tortured. But basically they were saying, like they were, they were confirming that servants in this household were treated abominably, but at the same time, they were all tortured themselves before they gave these statements. Sort of like in Salem Witch Trials. If you listen to Aaron Mankey's podcast about that, he gets into this, where it's like the statements that people give under duress, like where they've been tortured into saying things, when they're giving details of stuff about witchcraft or stuff about like weird sex, serial killing, like that says more about the questioners and it does about the people or what really happened. Like all the weird messed up details are what's coming, I think, suspect, strongly suspect, that's just coming from the questioners' own imaginations and they're putting the words into these people's minds rather than those people repeating those things necessarily. I mean, it's been proven numerous times between then and now, and even then, that torture, um, testimony that is provided from a torture situation is not uh, always true. That's not a method to get people to tell the truth. That's just a method to get people to say what you want to hear so you'll stop torturing them. And Thurzo himself clearly even knew that because he took these records and it said on the records, like, this testimony was gotten by torture. But then when he wrote up his report for the king, he was like, cross that off so the king wouldn't know that these statements were, were made under duress. So... At this point, so there's, there's this trial is going on. All these witnesses are appearing. Elizabeth herself not appearing because she, as a noble person, wasn't allowed to appear or like it would be unseemly for her to appear. And the trial is technically for the servants and not for her. So like, we'll just tuck her away for a minute. We'll go back to her in a second. But all these people are testifying, like hundreds of people are testifying. Many of them were the relatives or in-laws of Thurzo himself. What a coincidence or uh, servants who had been tortured to say whatever. And then also just like sort of a widespread momentum start building up where people are just like, if you were part of this, the lower class and you had been treated so shittily for so long, if you see like, oh, this is a place where I can like come and say these horrible things that happened and maybe some justice will happen. So people just started chiming in. So hundreds of people started testifying and among them was a woman known only as Susanna. And so she appeared, we don't even know her last name. So she said that her friend had seen Elizabeth had been keeping a list of how many people she had killed. So like, just think about that for a second. So Susanna, a woman with no last name who never appeared again. We don't know who she is. Anna Dervulia in disguise. I mean, no, but like maybe. So Susanna appears, she says, you know, I never saw anything, but my friend who worked there said that he had been working there one day and he saw a list 
that Elizabeth Bathory had been keeping, and it was a list of all the people she had killed, and there was like 650 names on the list. And that's where we get this 650 number from. No one else ever said that. Um, the first surveillance had estimated like 30 to 50 people died per year, which in Renaissance Hungary is not weird considering how many people would have been working in Elizabeth Bathory's home. But 650 is a massive number. The only evidence, quote unquote, evidence we have for that is a woman named Susanna, no last name, said her friend saw a list. And they were like, great, so can you like provide us the list? And she never did. But that's that's where that number comes from. And today, Elizabeth Bathory is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific female serial killer, killing up to 650 people. So literally, that's the only place that number comes from. Anyway, other witnesses started saying other things that Thurzo, I suspect, kind of got them to do just so he could have some backup plans to ruin her reputation. Some people mentioned witchcraft. One person said that Elizabeth Bathory had made a secret magic cake that she was going to feed to her enemies to try and kill the king, etc. So it was just like a huge show trial. Everybody was lying. And at the very end of it, the four servants were all found guilty. Three of them were executed for their crimes. The fourth person, Catalin, the one who everyone sort of agreed, wasn't as involved in the the tormenting of young servant girls. We're not sure what happened to her. She might have been put to death. She might have been sent to jail, but she was like slightly higher class than the other servants. So maybe she was just like sent off to a nunnery or something like that. During all this, Elizabeth still set aside. We'll get to her in a minute. So the four servants were found guilty. This whole thing was just like trashing the Bathory family name. And Elizabeth's longtime sort of advisor, there was a woman named Irvitsi, who was the wife of a farmer, and she was some sort of folk healer who had been helping Elizabeth for a long time with uh, various things, because that wasn't a strange thing to do, was just sort of grabbed and burned at the stake for allegedly being complicit in Elizabeth's crimes. And this is based on what some of the witnesses had said during the trial. She wasn't even put on trial, Ertzi. She just was grabbed and burned, basically, specifically for having been involved in baking that evil magic poison cake. So while this is all happening, Elizabeth was just kept in a room by herself and not just a room with a door. Like sometimes when you hear about British people who were sent to the Tower of London for prison, it's basically like fancy apartments. This is like she's put in a room that was bricked in, so there's no door and no windows and just a little sort of like hole for air and also that like food could be slid in and out of. And so, and that's just where she was kept. So while this trial was going on, Thurzo is sending his records to the king in Hungary, being like, yep, here's what's up, you know, Elizabeth Bathory, here's all these statements, totally didn't torture anybody, this is what's going on. The Hungarian king was like, oh, shouldn't we get like a statement from her? Shouldn't we like let her testify on her own behalf? And Thurzo was like, yeah, sure. And for three years, he just never did. So part of why he didn't do that was he had agreed on a deal with Elizabeth's male relatives, so her son's guardian her sons-in-law, um, that basically, if she was never put on trials, then they and Thurzo would divide up her money and estates between themselves. So she was kept in a room in her same castle where she had been living. I think the same one where she was arrested, perhaps. I'm not sure. She had a lot of castles, but for sure castle that she used to live in. So she was just trapped in a room for four years, during which time all these trials were happening. She had no voice, like... I'm sure she had a voice. She could talk. But like she had no, no one would listen to her. Nobody was on her side. So she'd been so, 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 so powerful. But then just suddenly, not at all. And because she wasn't put on trial, she wasn't convicted of anything. She wasn't even charged with anything. Just the servants were. So it's like she was just put in jail, not put on trial. And they just kind of waited for her to die. And... At one point, Thurzo's wife um, was given basically a citation by the authorities for being a horrible person for going into Elizabeth's castle and taking her money and dresses or something 
So like everybody in the story is terrible. Elizabeth might have been terrible also, but at this point, it's hard not to feel badly for her. So she was 54 years old when she died. Bricked up in this room, they just found her body there. She had never been formally charged with anything. She had never been found guilty of anything. She'd just been hidden away in a little room, sort of not treated like a person for four years. Um, one year before she died, her nephew Gabor, the Prince of Transylvania, had been murdered, perhaps by Thurzo or on Thurzo's instruction. But basically that paved the way for the Hungarian Empire to take over Transylvania. And with his death and Elizabeth's death, Basically, that marked the end of the Bathory family's power and influence in Eastern Europe. But the story doesn't end there, of course. More than 100 years later, a man named Laszlo Turotsky uh, wrote sort of an unauthorized biography of Elizabeth Bathory. And he's the one who threw in the detail that she liked to bathe in the blood of young victims. So again... If we're like, oh, Elizabeth Bathory is so creepy. It's like, no, you know who's creepy is the people writing these stories. So like the whole thing about bathing in blood never came up once over the course of hundreds of victims during the actual trial. What did come up was um, bathing in ice, which a lot of people thought was weird and which might have been just some sort of weird medical thing they were into. But anyway, bathing in blood. Not mentioned at all until this one guy wrote a biography that included that. This is where we start getting stuff about her secret, illegitimate teenage baby as well. Then the myth started getting embellished even more, especially in the Victorian time period, where more people started writing about it. Because, you know, Dracula and stuff became a popular story. Allegedly, on Bram Stoker's... So the inspiration for Dracula itself was the Transylvanian soldier... Um, Vlad Tepish, but he might have been also inspired by some of the folk stories about Elizabeth Bathory, which was basically the story became that she was an older woman who was jealous of young women, and so she killed them and bathed in their blood to magically make herself look young or something. Um, she's also the blood aspect started making her become presented as maybe sort of a vampire. And as I noted before, she is still as of the time I'm recording this, in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific female serial killer, even though on their page on Guinness Book of World Records, it says she is alleged to have killed up to 650 people, which is like, is that what it takes to get the world record in something? Just like a random woman named Susanna with no last name says her friend saw a list of names that you think was a list of murder victims? Anyway, the castle where she died is in, so it's called Kacztis Castle. It's in modern-day Slovakia. The castle itself was abandoned in 1708, and it's basically ruins, but you can visit it in the city of Kacztis, um, where there's also a museum, and that's also where the church where Elizabeth's body was interred, is housed. So I for sure want to shout out the book that I learned so much of this about, which is a biography by a man named Tony Thorne, that is called Countess Dracula, The Life and Times of Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess. He used a lot of original texts, um, a lot of the archival materials written in Hungarian and Slovakian, to really look at Elizabeth's letters, to look at the witness testimony. He even got current um, lawyer to look over the case and testimony to think like, you know, if you were the lawyer, would you have found her guilty, etc. There's so many things that are like, Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess, and they don't really delve into, but what was the actual story? Like, what's the actual history? And this biography absolutely does. And it's really well written, and I recommend it a lot. And now it's time to score Elizabeth Bathory on our scale. So the first category is scandaliciousness. And this is tricky because we're looking at her and who she was and what she might have actually done. The scandal itself, like the fact that she might have, the fact that her legend is now that she was a lesbian vampire who sex murdered 650 virgins to bathe in their blood is pretty extremely scandalous. At the time with the trial, 
alleged was that she might have killed up to 650 people, also in like a weird sex crime sort of way. Did she actually do what we don't know? But people, I'm going to give her a 9 out of 10 because the allegations are maximum scandalous. But the fact that she may not have actually done it is why I'm taking off one, one point. Keep her from a 10. In terms of scheminess, this is tricky because she, if she was a serial killer of 650 people, you know what? Even if she was, that wouldn't have been a lot of scheminess because if she was this super rich noble serial killing a bunch of servant girls, she wouldn't have had to have been schemy because nobody would have stopped her. So, and the fact that she was caught would mean that she wasn't schemy. She was really capable. She was good at running the household. No, but Thurzo truly out-schemed her real family. I don't think I'm going to give her I'm going to give her a three for scheminess, I think, because she did a good job running the household, which might have included some scheminess. The fact that she went to the authorities at that one point to be like, hey, guess what? I didn't kill this person. The fact that she lasted as long as she did, surrounded by entirely horrible people, means she would have a certain innate level of scheminess. But both her alleged crimes and what she might have actually done, neither of which involved a very high level of scheminess. Her significance. This is where I think she's going to wreck up some points because she's super famous. Well, she isn't herself, but the legend of her, the whole story of her, there's like countless like death metal bands and songs and books and movies. People remember her in a way that they don't anyone else, any of the other women that we've done thus far in the show. Like her significance to like world history, you know, she wasn't a queen. She didn't affect things in that way, but I'm going to give her a seven for significance because I think her legend is significance, even if she herself didn't affect the events of world history personally. The last one is the sexism bonus, and I am giving her a goddamn 10 in this because if she had been a man... None of this shit would have happened to her. She could have serial killed 5,000 young servant girls and nobody would have batted an eye or cared. But because she was a woman, when her husband died, she became vulnerable. And that's why basically everybody in her whole life turned on her. So that gives her a huge total. See, 19, 20, 29. That gives her a score of 29, which is the highest, highest score of anybody that we've done so far. So yeah, this is such a tricky thing to talk about, and I hope I've done it as respectfully as possible. The whole thing is just when I started reading about her, something just didn't seem right when I was reading about like, yeah, she was this noble woman and she killed all these people and she bathed in her blood. And it's like, okay, well then why didn't anyone ever find any bodies? Like there was the one that there's a brought in, but if she killed 650 bodies and if 650 women and all these people had witnessed it like why was there no evidence for it and why didn't Thurzo ever put her on trial for it and why like it just doesn't all add up to me which is why I was really grateful to find that one book Tony Thorne's biography which I'll put a link to in the show information anyway as this is the fourth episode of vulgar history but the first one since i've had a lot of infrastructure set up so i just wanted to let you know about a bunch of places where you can catch up with what's all things vulgar history so we have uh twitter which is at vulgar history we're on instagram at vulgar history pod and that's where i'm going to post um some images and stuff related to the episode if you want to see pictures of elizabeth and that sort of stuff and i have a merch store which is at teespring.com slash stores slash vulgar history. And what I've been doing is creating a different t-shirt slash other item for each person who we look at in each episode. So for Elizabeth Bathory, it's sort of like a black t-shirt with just the little crest, the like dragon eating its own tail in a circle crest. So it sort of looks almost like a private school shirt with a little crest in the breast area. Then on the back, it says Bathory in white letters, sort of like a sports jersey. It's like the most goth thing you could ever imagine. 
So hey, you can find that at teespring.com slash stores slash vulgar history. My name is Ann Foster. I have a Patreon that's at patreon.com slash Ann Foster Writer. And my other writing is at annfosterwriter.com. Um, thank you so much for listening. And I'll talk to you all next time. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming, and death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Do you know what lies within nothing? No. Do you know where it ends? Do you want to know? Yes. <laughs> Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com.